Good afternoon. I'm Beth Carlson, the president of Dewey Memorial Hall and a founder and board member of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center for Freedom and Democracy, uh, who is presenting this program tonight in, uh, in partnership with Dewey Memorial Hall. I am pleased to welcome these illustrious scholars and will now turn over the mic to Dr. Francis Jones Sneed, um, a board member of uh, the Du Bois Freedom Center. I'm really pleased to be joined today by three scholars um, who have delved into the life of Elizabeth Freeman and actually have some really kind of exciting um, points of view <laughs> about uh, Elizabeth Freeman, which I hope will lead to a discussion, doing a Q&A, a really lively discussion. We did this uh, panel for that, uh, not that we are all uh, call ourselves definitive scholars on Freeman by any kind of way, but are all interested in the Freeman story and how the freedom, Freeman story comes to us um, in light of the unveiling of the statue uh, to Elizabeth Freeman on Sunday. I wrote um, in uh, 2006 for the Upper Housatonic African American Trail Project a little disclaimer to the entry of the book that I'd like to read to you before I introduce you to my uh, other panelists. This is by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, if a thing is despised, either because of ignorance or because it is despicable, you will not alter matters by changing the name. If men despise Negroes, they will not despise them less if the Negroes are called colored or Afro-Americans. The feeling of inferiority is in you, not in any name. The name merely evokes what is already there. Exercise the hateful complex, and no name can ever be made to hang over your head. A Negro by any other name would be just as black and just as white, just as ashamed of himself, and just as shamed by others as today. It is not the name, it's the thing that counts, unquote. That Du Bois wrote that uh, as a part of a crisis article that he wrote in 1928. Um, and if we change just a few words, it would be really similar to what we are facing today anyway. The old childhood rhyme of sticks and stones will break your bones, but words can never hurt you, has never been held true for people of African descent. We have been trying to find a name for ourselves since the early migrations out of Africa. The problem is that enslaved people were rarely allowed to name ourselves. Rather, we became known by the names of our enslavers. As soon as slavery ended, one of the first things that happened as ex-enslaved people, they changed their names sometimes selecting fanciful titles such as Queen Esther or surnames of kind masters of famous people. Throughout their history in this country, they were divided over how to designate themselves as a people. Africans, colored Americans, blacks, Negroes, Afro-Americans, African-Americans. All enjoyed some popularity at various times. It is no wonder that the quest for self-identification continues into the 21st century. When the debate surfaced in 1989 over what we would call ourselves black or African Americans, Ebony Magazine interviewed several prominent black leaders for their views. There was not a consensus as Dr. Benjamin Hook, who was then the executive director for the NAACP said, the group would not take a position, noting, quote, this does not indicate a lack of concern about the issue, but rather an abiding respect for the sound judgment of our people who on their own will reach a consensus about what to be called, just as they have done in the past. He concluded his remarks by saying, the dialogue about what we call ourselves 
should not be permitted to overshadow the more immediate and probing and pressing problems that affect our communities. Hence, we come to Elizabeth Freeman, who a lot of people know as Mom Beck. And we have said that the title of Mom Beck is a title given by the Cedric children whom she nannied. Before she came to the Cedric household, she was known as Bet, as in Bet and Brome, or Brome and Bet, uh, in, the, in the civil case uh, that freed her. After she was freed, she took her own name, which was Elizabeth Freeman. And in the 21st century, I think we as adults don't want to call her what the Cedric children called her. We want to call her by the name that she claimed for herself, Elizabeth Freeman. And that is part of the issues that we'll discuss today. We're very happy to have Sari Ellestine, professor of English at UMass Boston, Kendra Phil, associate professor of history and Africana studies at Tufts University, and Carrie Greenwich, who's assistant professor of race, colonialism, and diaspora at Tufts University. We'll start with Sari. Thank you, Francis, and um, thank you to the organizers for including me um, in this conversation. I'm honored to be here alongside these brilliant scholars and to participate in the long tradition of memorializing Elizabeth Freeman. As we celebrate Elizabeth Freeman's exceptional role in the Berkshire's history and in American history more broadly, I want to use this time to think critically about how the project of telling her story in the past has sometimes focused more on white New England progressivism than on black freedom. Our conversation today and the weekend's events offer an opportunity to think anew about the meaning of Freeman's life and what lessons it holds for our present. As a literary studies scholar, I came to Elizabeth Freeman through my work on American women writers. As many of you may know, Freeman lived with the Sedgwick family of Stockbridge for 27 years after Theodore Sedgwick, a local lawyer, represented her in the legal case that resulted in her emancipation from slavery and set a precedent for abolition in the Commonwealth. Following this legal victory, Freeman lived in the Sedgwick home as a domestic worker and raised the Sedgwick children, including Catherine Mariah Sedgwick, who became one of the best-selling novelists of the era. Her books were often compared to those of Nathaniel Hawthorne and James Fenimore Cooper. But it may be that her narrative of Elizabeth Freeman's life is her most enduring and consequential work. Much of the information, including the off-cited anecdotes and quotations that now circulate about Freeman, derived from Sedgwick's essay, Slavery in New England, which appeared in the magazine Bentley's Miscellany in 1853. I also want to acknowledge the work of local historians, including David Levinson, Emily Piper, and Bernard Drew, and others who've done much to reconstruct details of Freeman's life beyond the Cedric accounts. My own work is indebted to theirs. In my brief remarks, I want to focus on a couple of key texts, which, like Sedgwick's published narrative, have shaped what we know about Freeman, and in some cases, obscured critical elements of her story. To begin, I want to consider uh, the miniature watercolor portrait of Freeman painted by Susan Ann Livingston Ridley Sedgwick, Catherine's sister-in-law in 1811. Some have read the very existence of this portrait as proof of the Sedgwick family's deep love and respect for Freeman. But beginning in the 18th century, enslaved people were often featured in white family portraits as signs of status and prosperity. In this portrait, Frederick Freeman is alone. She wears a white bonnet, blue dress, and a gold beaded necklace that was a gift from Catherine. And I'll return to the necklace shortly. She gazes from the portrait with a serious countenance, one that is hard to read, almost Mona Lisa-like in its expressive ambiguity. What we cannot see in this genteel portrait is the very bodily detail that Freeman most sought to display. According to Sedgwick's narrative, Freeman had a prominent scar as the result of a violent attack by her enslaver, Hannah Ashley. She never covered the wound, and according to Sedgwick, used to say, when people said to me before Madam, why, Betty, what ails your arm? I only answered, ask Mrs. Thus, Freeman essentially dared white people to ask her enslaver for the details of the violence done to her and defiantly refused to narrate it herself. This anecdote suggests Freeman's awareness of the power of storytelling and reminds us of the ways that her body was first held in slavery and then later confined, contained in art and narrative to serve agendas that were not always her own. Perhaps the only extant document from which we can gain insight into Freeman's own wishes for her memorialization is her will. 
which she signed with an X on October 18, 1829. By that time, Freeman had moved into her own home and worked as a midwife and a healer in Stockbridge, earning enough money to expand her property. And in fact, she eventually became the second wealthiest black landowner in the area. Her will indicates that she owned 19 acres, as well as furniture, jewelry, and fine clothing. Her will also confirms that she had a daughter, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and it indicates that she had treasured possessions from her mother and father. She bequeathed to her daughter one black silk gown, got from Philadelphia, received from my father, as well as a short gown that was my mother's. These details suggest Freeman's resistance to the alienation of kinship enforced by slavery and her desire to ensure the generational transmission of financial stability to her descendants. She bequeathed her gold beads, likely those pictured in her portrait, to her great-granddaughter, Lydia Maria Van Schaak. Significantly, she left nothing to the Sedgwicks, and yet sometime after Freeman's death, Catherine Sedgwick notes that she transformed the gold beads in, from a necklace into a bracelet, adding a clasp, which she inscribed with the name Mumbet, by which the Sedgwick children had called Freeman, as Francis mentioned. Um, a member of the Sedgwick family then donated those beads to the Massachusetts Historical Society in 1884, explaining that the bracelet symbolized an epoch in our social and political progress. This raises the possibility that Freeman's will may not have been executed according to her wishes, as she sought to pass the gold beads onto the lineal descendants, who significantly Catherine disdained. In any case, Freeman's possessions became a symbol of white progress, housed in an elite institution rather than with Freeman's descendants. In closing, I want to turn to the earliest public memorial of Freeman, her gravestone in the Sedgwick family burial plot. Known as the Sedgwick Pie because of its unconventional circular shape, the plot is centered around Judge Theodore Sedgwick, who died in 1813, and his wife Pamela, their posterity spiraling out in concentric circles beyond them. Freeman is the only person buried in the Sedgwick plot who is not a Sedgwick by blood or marriage. Her stone near the center of the pie is etched with an epitaph written by Catherine. And I'm just going to read the, this is the epitaph. Elizabeth Freeman, also known by the name of Mumbet, died December 28, 1829. Her supposed age was 85. She was born a slave and remained a slave for nearly 30 years. She could neither read nor write, yet in her own sphere she had no superior or equal. She neither wasted time nor property. She never violated a trust nor failed to perform a duty. In every situation of domestic trial, she was the most efficient helper and the tenderest friend. Good mother, farewell. While this epitaph notes Freeman's exemplary personal characteristics, it oddly emphasizes, too, her servitude and her inability to read and write, a deprivation legally enforced on enslaved people and suffered by free people as well. Sedgwick's inclusion of this detail serves as one final reminder that Freeman could not tell her own story. The tombstones surrounding her, on the other hand, are etched with lines of poetry, phrases in Greek and Latin, at least one inscription with the Harvard seal, an immortal boast of belonging in an educational elite. Even in death, Freeman is encircled by a display of white privilege. Moreover, her burial in the Sedgwick pie entails the denial of a black family. The Sedgwick's insistence that she's their mother in the epitaph send-off replicates the proprietary logic of slavery, as it inserts their right to name as kinship and sentimentalize an asymmetrical relationship that was always a form of labor for Freeman, who in fact was a mother to her own child. The epitaph Sedgwick wrote for Freeman makes no mention of her path-breaking legal case, nor does it mention her own family, her relationships to her daughter, or grandchildren, the individuals named in her will. In this way, her burial site functions as a space of enclosure within the white family who claimed her, not just physically, but narratively. But Freeman's life held and holds meaning that cannot be contained. The cairn of memorial stones placed on top of her gravestone by visitors making the pilgrimage to pay their respects to this day indicate her enduring significance and the power of her memory. W.E.B. Du Bois, who was born and raised here in the Berkshires, claimed Freeman as an ancestor in two of his autobiographies. This genealogical counter-narrative suggests Freeman's importance to a tradition of black activism, thought, and uplift. As children's books heroize Freeman and museums insert her into patriotic stories of the revolution as a corrective to many generations of neglect, Freeman's own silence is a striking reminder of what Zora Neale Hurston called the muteness of slavery. As of Sunday, her gravestone will not be the only monument to Freeman and the Berkshires. A new statue will offer a belated homage to her extraordinary life and a reminder of the role she played in the long and still ongoing struggle for black freedom in New England and beyond.
you so much. Um, it's good to be here with all of you today and with my um, esteemed uh, colleagues. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Du Bois on my way back to Freeman. Um, in part because I've been working as the project historian for the Du Bois um, Center for Freedom and Democracy, um, and also um, because I spent a good portion of my career um, on Du Bois, kind of in the background on the side. Um, I edited uh, David Living Lewis's um, biography of Du Bois uh, while I was in graduate school about 15 years ago. Um, but I principally come to, to today's topic as a scholar of African American history and especially family history. So the first book that I wrote was about my, my own ancestors, my father's um, great-grandparents and their lives in slavery and freedom in the U.S. South and American West, specifically uh, Indian Territory and Oklahoma. Um, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes today about, about Du Bois' world and family history and about what Freeman uh, meant, what, what Freeman's life meant to the extent that he could know it to Du Bois, about their intertwined family histories and reflect a bit about the place of ancestry and inheritance in African American history and American history more broadly. Uh, so Du Bois, uh, our leading American intellectual and civil rights architect of the 20th century, his story in some ways is, is so much larger than life and it sometimes seems predestined, almost like it was always fully formed. It's often hard to imagine him having come step by painful step, moment by moment, like the rest of us, from a place, from a people, from other people's lives. In fact, Du Bois did not inherit a family tree, with the exception of a few lines of his great-grandmother's song, uh, an African song that she sang to him, his maternal grandfather's fireplace tongs, which he carried around for much of his life, and a one-time meeting with his father's father as a teenager, Du Bois knew strikingly little of his forebears as a young person. So the construction of William Edward Burkhardt Du Bois's genealogy was an undertaking. Responding in no small part to his father's sudden departure at two, his mother's stroke and premature death as a teenager, this tree involved hundreds of letters written to more distant relatives and county courthouses, visits to cemeteries, the drafting and revising of countless family trees, research into settlements across Massachusetts, New York, Connecticut, and immersion in the history of the African diaspora, including especially the Bahamas and Haiti. From adolescence through middle age, Du Bois scouted and sketched, documented, and imagined his ancestral heritage. He typed up family trees, memorialized his unknown forebears, obsessed over grave sites, you can see some of those sketches there um, that he made, proposed publishing his own family history, um, and often did this on the backs of his sociological studies, his surveys, his envelopes, his real job. <laughs> so you'd turn it over on the uh, sociological survey and see his genealogical notes on the back. Um, in spite of the scale and scope of this work, however, scholars have yet to engage with Du Bois as a genealogist, a family historian. He did much of this work privately, and he did it reflexively as if his life depended upon it. As he sketched these plots and communicated with potential relatives, wrote and rewrote the names of his ancestors or potential ancestors into family trees, he wrote his family into existence and rescued his interior world from the virulent racism that defined his lifetime. So I'm going to share just a few images that illuminate part of this search, including his own attempts to tie his family history to Elizabeth Freeman's. Um, and here you see um, uh, kind of an early, uh, well, actually a later um, uh, description of the song that I mentioned, um, a song that, that, that he learned or heard from his grandfather's uh, line. In 1890, he... <laughs> he um, he had, was asked in this assignment from the English department at Harvard, from his professor, to write something about, something about me. And at the time, William's knowledge of his own ancestry, genealogical forebears, and, and ideas about blood remained sparse. He said, for the usual purposes of identification, I have been labeled in this life William Edward Burghardt Du Bois. As to who I really am, I am much in doubt. He said there was little reliable information from casual hints and observation. That's all he had. He believed, in fact, that there are many who could supply better data than the writer himself. In light of such, quote, personal uncertainty, unquote, he could offer only, quote, alleged facts from memory. He explained that these inconspicuous, he went on to say that these were inconspicuous origins. He says, I believe there was nothing unusual about my birth. I point with pride to no long line of distinguished ancestors. Indeed, I have often been in a quandary as to how those revered ones spent their time. 
I'm reading behind you. From this circumstance, I naturally prefer men, other things being unequal, who have no grandfathers. My boyhood seems, my memory serves me really, to have been filled with individuals of surprising little importance, such as brooks with stones across grass and gate posts. However, um, he also says, in early youth, a great bitterness entered my life and kindled a great ambition. I wanted to go to college because others did. I came and graduated and now in search of a PhD and bread. I believe, foolishly perhaps, but sincerely, that I have something to say to the world and have taken English in order to say it well. Um, so he's a college student at that time, and uh, it's 1890. And about uh, five years later, I'll go to the next slide, um, he is at Wilberforce teaching and the one after that. And he's teaching um, there for the year. And he drafts one of his first family trees. Do you see that first tree? Yeah, there. And at the top, he lists Thomas Edson. This was the African man named Tom who had been forced into slavery in West Africa, the, the earliest ancestor to which he could trace his family. Beneath uh, Thomas Edson, he had J Jack Burghardt and his son Othello, his own grandfather. Um, but above Thomas Edson's name, he had written King, question mark, um, in all capital letters. Years later, he revisited this, and he said, acknowledged that he had wanted at the time to believe that his family came from African royalty. Um, and, uh, and he kind of um, uh, retreated from that idea. However, he was, in, by this point, well immersed in a search for, for his own ancestors, to, to, to find an, a, a genealogical narrative that made sense to him. Um, and although he could not confirm the African prince sometimes or king status of Thomas Burghardt, he soon had records of, his, of this man's service in the American Revolutionary War. Having been educated at Harvard, Du Bois would have been surrounded by students who were members or soon to be members of the Sons of the American Revolution. Uh, du Bois became determined to become the first black member of this organization. Um, that was a lifelong attempt of his, um, which succeeded briefly and then it was rescinded and then ultimately failed again in the 1940s. Um, in the midst of that, however, he exchanged a feverish bunch of letters with his aunt Lucinda Wooster, who at this point lived in the house of what he called the House of the Black Burghearts uh, on Egremont Plain. Um, and, um, and soon enough, um, he began to ask her questions about Elizabeth Freeman. He wanted to believe uh, and, and to find out if, whether Elizabeth Freeman was his ancestor, and he also wanted to know about Tom's service in the Revolutionary War. And we'll go to that next slide. Yes, so these are some of the letters, this slide and the next one and the next, that he writes back and forth his, his um, his relatives, particularly um, Lucinda uh, Wooster and to James, asking about um, Elizabeth Freeman. So he asked Lucinda whether Mumbet of Sockbridge was related to us. Um, that was his question. And he asked about her family. Um, he also, when he got the answer that perhaps she was not um, uh, a, a, a blood relation, um, he nonetheless got this answer that the person that Jack Jackson Berger was married to later in life was Betsy Humphrey. And Betsy Humphrey is a name um, that appears in the Freeman uh, genealogy. Um, and it seems uh, to me from the, the searching that I've been doing that in fact um, there was um, very likely a connection here and other scholars have suggested that this is very um, plausible, David Levinson and others, that in fact um, Elizabeth Freeman's um, daughter or granddaughter um, may have been, and Sarah and I have been talking about whether it's a daughter or granddaughter, this second wife of, of, of W.B. Du Bois's um, grandfather, Jackson. Part of the kind of <laughs> difficulty Du Bois was up against is that there wasn't much mention of Freeman's daughter by the time of Du Bois's lifetime. The story of Freeman in uh, the Ashley House was framed as, as Freeman and, and, her, and her sister, as opposed to her daughter. And so once we kind of um, correct for that, you can kind of see how Du Bois was stopped in its tracks in 1907 when he was doing this research. Um, so William's genealogical quest was far more than kind of this, the attempt to join the Sons of the American Revolution. He also was attempting to, con to connect himself to other black Berkshires, um, such as Elizabeth Freeman. My dear cousin, I presume you think I am slow and I hope to have the reputation of being sure and answering any letters received. This is to Du Bois, 1908. I wrote to my brother and asked him if they could remember ever seeing our grandfather, Jack Burghardt. And then later on the letter says, we don't remember anything about our grandmother. His first wife was Violet and his second wife's name was Betsy Humphrey. So this is some just scattered documents we've been collecting 
around the descendants of Freeman going into the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and this is really like in the last few days that I've gotten past on this show, thanks to Sari. And we've been chatting about the connection between Freeman and Du Bois and other descendants who went on to do quite interesting things in the late 19th and early 20th century. And I'm gonna just close by talking about the importance of ancestry to both of these figures, to Freeman and to, and to Du Bois. So origins, African diasporic origins and beyond um, were, were kind of everywhere and nowhere in the Hudson Houstonic Valleys, in Du Bois' family trees, transmitted in songs like Do Banakoba, the song that he remembered learning at home, and in objects like Elizabeth Freeman's um, dress and dresses that she passed on. Later in life, William learned that his great grandmother's song uh, may have been a Wolof song from Senegambia about confinement or captivity. In both Darkwater and his other autobiography, Du Bois recalled Tom's wife having, quote, clasped her knees and rocked and crooned the African song. He writes, it was his one truly palpable tie to that African homeland. He would spend an academic, oh, this is uh, David Lewis, spend an academic and political lifetime trying to interpret and shape. Violet's song had been the earliest prompting of a very New England and supremely intellectual great-grandson to try to discern a few true notes of a remote, vestigial, and mysterious heritage." Unquote. Around this time, Du Bois hand-sketched his own family crest, which you can see here. Inside a bordered square was a sword, a chain, seemingly representing the family's enslaved ancestry, and the words, Do Banakoba, Genemi, Ben Denuli, Ben Ole, walked around the square's perimeter. Above this, he sketched an alternate image, a series of chain links with the song's words on the interior. Similarly, while Elizabeth Freeman had been locally known for successfully petitioning for her freedom, for protecting the property of the Cedric family during Shea's rebellion, Elizabeth Freeman also had a family of her own, ancestors and descendants, a daughter, a grandchildren, great-grandchildren. When she died, she wrote in that will, one of the only documents we have of her transcribed words, that she bequeathed to her daughter one black silk gown received of my father, who may, he or his father, have been African born, and one short gown that was my mother's. Long before I cared for the discipline of history, my grandmother's stories made me whole, pointing to things I sensed, but for which I had no words. The writer Ronnie Hartfield has said, our mother's stories have given us the maps by which our tribe locates its journeying, its dreams and rivers, its stony places, its sometimes astonishing, more often incredibly affirming twists and turns. In his 1892 autobiography, Frederick Douglass wrote, the reader must not expect me to say much of my family. Genealogical trees did not flourish among slaves, unquote. Forcibly separated from family members by the first and second middle passage, by slavery and the slave trade, our ancestors were also separated to varying degrees from their family histories. Just as enslaved children were stunned when they found out they could be sold, their descendants today continue to grapple with its twin legacy, the deprivation of family history, as the historian Heather Williams has written. Yet fragments of family lore spanning Africa, the Caribbean, and the US circulated and held value among enslaved women, men, and children, and free people of color long before the Civil War, long before the end of, the end of slavery in the North. By taking seriously African-American family history and genealogy, we turn our sights to the other work our ancestors did, the tear-stained work that happened behind closed doors and when no one was watching, to quilt together the loose ends, longings, unspeakable truths, and silences, to imbue our lives with meaning, to craft a future out of the past. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna speak for long because I know this is an opportunity for people to ask questions and, and ask us, but um, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do is, um, like Sari was talking about Freeman herself and the complications of stories, and Kendra was talking about Du Bois and his uh, uh, reclamation of Elizabeth Freeman and her family. I'm gonna kind of try to put a lot of uh, the history in context to remind us that um, people like Freeman and Du Bois come from communities and that those communities have a long history in the Berkshires. Um, I myself um, specialize, or specialize, <laughs> put in quotes, um, look, examine blackness and uh, African diaspora communities in New England. Uh, my first book was, uh, was about that. Uh, my second book sort of alludes to that as well. So one of the things I wanna point out is that um, 
sort of begin with a story. So in eight, 1946, so more recent than uh, Du Bois and Elizabeth Freeman, F. Turner L., leader of the Black Moorish National Congress, purchased a storefront at 740 South Main Street in Great Barrington. Founded in the 1910s, the Moorish National Congress was one of many black nationalist sects founded during the era that one historian has referred to as, quote, the nadir of American race relations. Between emancipation in 1865 and segregation of the federal government in 1915, segregation, disenfranchisement, and white racial violence afflicted African American communities across the country a form of white racial backlash that led many black community leaders toward independent religions like the Moorish National Congress that sought radical racial uplift and racial pride. The fact that F. Turner L. chose Great Barrington and the Berkshires as a site for his Black Nationalist Congress in 1946 might seem anomalous, given the supposed whiteness of the region. At the time, the black population of Great Barrington was around 175 or less than 2% of the population. And the black community of Berkshire County hovered just above 843 people from Sheffield to Egremont. However, the fact that Turner L. chose Great Barrington is indicative of the existence of a well-established and politically activist African descended community in the region that had been here for generations. Although the Moorish National Congress never opened specifically at 740 South Main Street in Great Barrington, Turner L. and his followers continued to sing the praises of the town and the Berkshires more generally, but specifically the black residents. As he stated, quote, the area was a place where the Negroes, though few in number, are as race conscious as any street corner preacher in Harlem. When the Moorish National Congress purchased the Great Barrington storefront in 1946, African Americans had been in the Berkshires since at least the 1740s. It was in that decade when Peter Hogboom um, recorded 20 Negroes, as he called them, at his relative's estate in Sheffield, in addition to the, quote, 33 that he kept on his own farm in Claverack, New York. Hogboom was the slave owner of the woman we now know as Elizabeth Freeman. He gifted to his daughter Hannah, uh, Mumbet, as a present from her father when she married Sheffield's John Ashley in the 1750s. Nearly two centuries between Elizabeth Freeman's and F. Turner L.'s time in the Berkshires indicates the long, complicated, and we should remember nuanced history of African Americans in the region. A history that we had the opportunity to celebrate even as we valorize and risk valorizing mere individual black fi figures like Freeman, Du Bois, James Weldon Johnson, and others who called the region home. Rather than stories of supposed racial exceptionalism, stories that Sari Edelstein so brilliantly complicates in her article and that uh, previous historians like Francis Jones Need have talked about. Um, rather than stories of supposed racial exceptionalism, we have the opportunity now to tell stories of black people, of black institutions, of black families, of black kin, of black communities that have shaped Berkshire history. Rather than stories of supposedly triumphant individuals, Today offers us the opportunity to celebrate, acknowledge, and then analyze the complex communities from which these individuals come. Black folk and their descendants have been here since the region was founded, and Native Americans were, of course, the first people here as well, even if the archive is not designed to record them. I will conclude with a quote by the historian Nell Irvin Painter, who says, quote, beyond even the most finely tuned categories lies something exceeding race, class, and gender, individual subjectivity. She says, I remain convinced that history, that history should keep in sight, historians should keep in sight the fundamental lessons of psychology and psychoanalysis. That all people, even people who describe themselves as race and gendered, are individuals the individual subjects develop within families, that families need not be related by blood or biologically. Families at every economic level, every racial category, inculcate the finest and basis of values. Thank you. And now we'll open it up for questions, comments. Yes, hi. Yeah, 
I mean, one of the things I always uh, stress and I try to do in my own work is complicate the idea that just because a place looks a certain way in the time and period we are in does not mean that it's always been that way. And also that these are categories, right, which means they change over time. So that means that somebody like an Elizabeth Freeman lived in the Berkshires in the early 19th century was not the same environment as Du Bois grew up in in the 1860s and 1870s, was not the same society that James Weldon Johnson encountered when he came in the 19 teens, was not the same place that um, um, uh, Turner L. encountered when he came in the 1940s. Um, so to say were, were African American peoples welcomed, I would say, um, you know, I think that depends on what time period and place you're talking about, just like any, any place um, in the uh, United States. And it goes to what Sari is pointing out in her article, which is that, you know, we have to look at um, beyond kind of this idea of New England exceptionalism and New England progressivism and that this is a racial beacon, right? Um, and really look at what's going on in these communities and with these people over time. And recognizing that, you know, in 2022, there are racial dynamics in the Berkshires, just as there are racial dynamics in the Berkshires in 1982, and those might be completely different or look different based on the community you're talking to. And so I always urge people to talk, actually talk to black people in the community, right? Um, and not just one black person, right? Um, who you happen to meet somewhere, right? Talk to people about what their experiences are, what it's like sending their kids to school, right? What it's like, you know, um, being a full-time year-long residence here versus being someone who vacations here, right? Those are all dynamics that come into every, every time we, we look at a certain period in history. And I also like to say that um, it points out that um, in the 1940s and 50s, um, there was nationally something called the Green Book, which uh, black travelers, of course, could not stay at hotels. Yeah. And so um, Mr. Green identified places in the country that when blacks traveled, they could stop over. And in um, the Berkshires, there were four places uh, that was in the Green Book. Uh, so you know that African Americans were traveling here and wanted to come here. A lot of African Americans came because they had relatives mm -hmm. also in the area. And one thing that was different, I think, from white residents, which I found when I came here in the 1990s, I uh, live in North County and I met people who had never visited, who were born and raised in North County but had never visited South County. Uh, and vice versa. But the first thing that I did when I stepped on the ground here, I wanted to know where are the other African Americans in the area. And I want to get in touch with them, know who they are, their churches, and those kinds of things. And so I think that African Americans, no matter what time period they lived here, they were very cognizant that they wanted to find others that looked like themselves and that's the reason why we have Clinton uh, Church, is because uh, ex, uh, enslaved people came, they saw no religion uh, or religious institution that they felt comfortable with, and so they built their own. So I think that um, African Americans are, <laughs> I don't know, they, they understand what they have to do when they go to places where there are very, very few of us. Oh, me? Uh, Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. And the next one is called The Grimkeys, um, The Legacy of Slavery in an American Family. We should have had that. October 8th. Yes. Uh, November 8th. November 8th. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Glass of water on that one. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I feel like my remarks sort of made it clear that I feel like we, we really don't have Mumbet's interiority. I mean, I think Carrie was talking about um, that history has to think about the psychology of, of people, right? And we don't, we don't have any access to, to Freeman's 
interiority. Uh, we have a lot of imagined uh, versions of what that might have looked like, but we, we can't know it. Um, and I think, you know, we, ha we have this opportunity now, I think this weekend is kind of amazing in that we can think critically about that silence, even as we honor that she lived an extraordinary life. I don't know that I would go so far as to call it whitewashing. I, I, I feel like, you know, maybe, um, but I think that it has been a narrative that has been used for sort of this white self-congratulation. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there's ways to honor her and to think about her um, role here that um, can coexist with um, the, the information that we don't know. We don't know much about her descendants. We don't know whether she, um, how much she was paid by the Sedgwicks. We don't know if she was married, who fathered her children. All of these things are absences that we don't know and that we can, um, we can speculate about. But um, I think uh, the, the opportunity here is to, to, to really approach her story in a new way um, that doesn't always end with a sort of rosy picture of, of freedom. Um, so that's sort of, that's my diplomatic response. Yeah. I might to add one, one, one thing um, um, in thinking about, I mean, I appreciate that you're, you're asking a question a little bit about the archive, right? What the sources are that we, that we bring to bear and uh, both in the case and very often in the case of African American history in New England, as, as my colleague Carrie Greenwich can, uh, can say better than I, um, we are, we encounter people who have been plucked out of context, right? Mm -hmm. And they've been plucked out of context but, and in a, in a way that suggests the problem of the archive, whose papers were made or kept precious, um, who had the luxury of staying in the same house over multiple generations, who has objects to pass down. Um, you know, obviously um, many of us do, but, but, but where do those objects end up, right? Um, over time, right? and and so both in the in the case of Du Bois, which is, is you know m more, um, um, which I know a lot more about because of, in part because of the papers we have, um, even Du Bois in the later period um, was very much claimed by the white Congregational Church and Great Barrington, who did in fact help to support his tuition at Fisk and so forth, and he wrote to Reverend Scudder from Fisk in the 1880s, all of this is true, and yet right across the street there is uh, the first black institution of Du Bois's life, um, the Amy Zion Church, the Clinton Church, um, the black church that he and his mother often attended, right? So, so that is a, is a good example of this contrast where until fairly recently, people had lots to say about his relationship to white institutions in town, to Frank Hosmer, his principal and teacher, right? But, but not enough, not nearly enough um, to approach accuracy, to say about the black families, the black kin networks, and institutions that he came out of, and we can say similar things or imagine similar things about Freeman. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just uh, going to say is that who are these things written for, or wh what what is the movie all about? I mean, who is actually supposed to be the audience uh, for this movie? The audience for this movie it was supposed to be white. You know, they did not think about a black audience in producing this movie. Um, and so a lot of times you have to ask, you know, those kind of questions, who is it meant for? Uh, because you'll find in Google a lot of uh, conversation about how this movie could have been different. And, and probably that's some of the kinds of things that we are talking about, how the story of Elizabeth Freeman could be told in a different kind of manner that would connect more to the, her own community rather than the white community which she uh, worked for or was enslaved by. Yeah, and, and just one other thing, just as somebody, as somebody who works with this stuff, I mean, the archive in Elizabeth Friedman's case, uh, it might be hard to find traces of her, but I mean, there's the black press um, found in 1827. And one of the things that amazed me, it always amazes me, is how much black people are talking about their family history and their communities. So there are ways you can trace these histories and these family histories against an archive, but it might not be the archive, traditional archive that you think of, right? 
you can go into other people's papers. One of the things is going into like the papers that are for you know Du Bois or James Weldon Johnson, who are very famous men. But they have all these conversations over the years with other black people who are talking about their families and their histories. So there is a way, um, and this is the beauty of you know archival research of finding you know primary source material on these people. But we have to reevaluate what source it is that we're looking at. If we're just looking at a narrative of an African American person from the 1820s by the white family that she worked for, or if we're just looking at it from the perspective of the white church that supported Du Bois, for instance, that's only, you're only getting a little bit of the story, as you would only get the little bit of the story for anybody, right? If you're only looking at that and saying, well, this that definitively says that this experience was this, right? You have to go, sort of go deeper if those sources are available. Others? Yes. I'm interested in Griffith Hall and his house, and he lives across the street from Moffat. It's been a while um, since I've read about Agrippa Hall, but I remember, and I think it's Gary Nash's book. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. He, doesn't he um, posit that perhaps Agrippa Hall moved out of the Sedgwick family uh, employ when um, Theodore was I think drafting part of a fugitive slave law. Mm -hmm. And w d did you come across that? I read the book, and uh, he's just speculating. Right, but I mean, I, I don't think, I don't know that we have anything definitive from Agrippa Hall. You, you probably know more than me about his particular, um, you know, what, his archive, but I mean, that, that was a pretty compelling um, interpretation to me about the timing of his departure, just mm -hmm. that. I mean, Theodore Sedgwick's complicated. He he participates in this case, and he, he wins this victory for Brahm and, and Freeman. Um, even, and, and he joins the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. He also, you know, he's, he, he has, he enslaves people, and he had, there's a bill of sale that he enslaved people. Then he also is drafting a fugitive slave law. So he's a real, it's very paradoxical, and I think that the Gary Nash biography, as far as I can recall, makes the compelling claim that at a certain point, Agrippa Hall was sort of like, enough, I, I don't need this job. You know, he's still participating in, in the institution of slavery, um, and he had enough money to, to, to live, live in it, to do a different job. And he was paid, as you said, as like a sort of toast maker and a master of ceremonies in town. Um, but I, I'm not an expert on Agrippa Hall, but that's the best I can do with that answer. He, his own, he, had, he, he was the biggest landowner, right, in the, in the town. Black landowner, yeah. And the qu question of um, descendants, I will just also add that um, our board chair of the Du Bois Freedom Center is a descendant of a cripple hall. Ray Gunn. Um, Ray Gunn. Who yeah. well, I know you all know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well. I was going to ask our, our resident uh, a local historian, Bernie Drew, if he had uh, anything to say from uh, that point. Uh, thank you, Bernie. It's, it just goes to show that there have been uh, lots of people looking at different kind of aspects of African American life in the Berkshires um, for, you know, at least, from my knowledge, 20 plus years and probably even longer. I had a question over here. Yes. Is there anything written on the trial itself? Okay, so you ready for some sources? Yeah. <laughs> I would look at Arthur Zilversmith's work. He's a legal historian. He's written about this case and also relation to Quack Walker's case. Um, I think he's an important source. I would look at um, I would look at Margot Minardi's book um, on New England slavery, and I would also look at Wendy Warren's work. Um, there are there there's a lot written in terms of the legal history, but those are th three places. Uh, Wendy Warren's book's really about New England slavery, but the other two are about mention this case in great detail. Um, with in terms of the genealogy in Freeman's in Freeman's case, in terms of Lizzie, like there's a lot of speculation. Her daughter was for sure named Betsy. Um, I think there was a granddaughter named Lizzie. Um, the book One Minute of Freedom, uh, One Minute of Free Woman is for sale here, and um, Emily Piper and David Levinson have thoughts about the genealogy that I think you'll find useful, but I would say that there's nothing that's definitive about who Lizzie is, whether it is a granddaughter or a daughter. And as um, Kendra said, until you know, relatively recently, people thought that it was her sister that was enslaved with her on the Ashley um, farm. So 
um, we're still really piecing it together. Um, and then what was the last question you asked? Uh, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> we, I can, uh, we can chat after. Whether the person was at the same time that Freeman was um, there. Let's chat after. Um, I'll make sure to give you my card, because there's a lot of questions I don't know the answers to, but I, I have some other sources I can point you toward on some of that. I'm interested to hear more about your, about your play as well. Yes. Is there anything unusual about I think that um, it's the laws and the specific period in Massachusetts. So Du Bois was born in 1868. Um, at that point, Massachusetts in the legislature had three black representatives, which is significant. Um, and they were responsible for a lot of the legislation that was passed that was relatively racially progressive compared to what was going on in the rest of the country. And I put that in comparison, you know, um, to the time period. The schools were not legally segregated, um, which was a reason again and again and again when you read black people who migrated to the area during the time period who talk about the fact that this, you, you didn't have to deal with legally segregated schools, now that changes over time. Um, the caveat is, you know, then the schools become segregated over time through policy. But at this specific time, late 19th century, they were not yet segregated legally by law. Um, and you have a very, very strong black community in New England and in the region that had been, that had been legally free at least since the 1790s, had access to political, excuse me, political, um, um, protest. So African Americans could, um, and this goes back to enslavement in New England, could petition. There was never any law against enslaved people petitioning in the colonies, right, in the New England colonies. So if you were enslaved in the first, you know, the first freedom um, suits in New England happened in like 1705, 1707. And that's because you were not legally prevented from doing so. And there's all Wendy Warren in her book talking about slavery and the nature of enslavement in New England. That was sort of the very specific um, aspect. So I think that when we look at someone like a Du Bois, we have to look at the context of the way that uh, blackness and black communities were legally and politically um, viewed and existed at the moment in time. Now, if you go forward a few more years, right, you'd get people um, who would come to New England who would argue that, well, they come at a time in the 1910s when the schools are segregating. And they have a completely different experience, right? So the sort of the context that happens. But I would say, you know, New England was a place that, like most of the country, uh, the par racial paradoxes are, you know, they're, they're Phenomenal, I would say, for the, for the era, right? You have uh, a very literate black population, so black um, enslaved people were encouraged to learn how to read, and that had to do with the Puritan idea of teaching enslaved people how to read the Bible. So that meant that you had a whole generation of black people who, who could read and write. Um, Elizabeth Freeman um, was uh, taken from upstate New York into Massachusetts. Upstate New York and New York did not allow black people to learn how to read. Massachusetts did. So we need to look at, uh, this is all to get, I won't get into too much detail, but this is to get into the idea of context, of space, of what different communities look like at a different time, and the fact that you have this very narrow window, uh, roughly 1850 to like 1910, and there's a lot of reasons why this changes, that there's, you know, New England was considered, as uh, James Weldon Johnson called it, the Mecca of the Negro, uh, because you could vote, there was, it, for a time, it was the only state that didn't have mob violence. Um, but James Weldon Johnson would say it was not a good state, place for a black person to make a living, right? So you have these two paradoxes that exist. And so it's something we need to, we need to um, again, is that when we're looking at these stories and looking at um, why is it that a Du Bois arises in the era, it's like sort of a, a marriage of a, a person and a place and a specific time in history. Um, and the fact that we know about him, um, there were, many sort of black people, and if you read the black press, you see this, who were just as brilliant, just as intelligent, and somehow they didn't have that, you know, it's, it's partially luck, right, that you, you end up in this situation where you're able to take advantage of these things. Okay. Um, the person in the back, uh, yes, yes. What's next is to get that center as a place that's open um, you know, so that we can start the program, and we have been doing programming all along, the kind of program that we can do without a physical space. 
Um, but I think that our uh, goal now is to get that physical space ready so that we can have it. But um, uh, indeed, um, turning it over to another generation <laughs> with uh, Kendra Phil, um, actually bringing to fore a dream that Du Bois had about having uh, a place where black scholars, artists um, could come to talk about the kind of work that they are doing and, and get it known uh, to people. Uh, it is one of the kind of things that we are working on now, and I think Kendra could speak more to that. Sure, so uh, thank you um, so much, Francis. So I think that we are, um, I mean, I keep thinking back to that, um, yeah, that COVID programming that you pulled together and it was just, just incredible and so powerful. If you haven't seen it, those are still available online um, each week, a different chapter of Souls of Black Folk with guest scholars, writers, vocalists, <laughs> and more, um, doing kind of a close read and engagement with what the text meant, what it means today. Um, while Du Bois's name is in the name of the center, the Du Bois Freedom Center, the Du Bois Center for Freedom and Democracy, and it was the first black institution of Du Bois's life, the mission of the center is, is all of this, right? It's, all, it, it's to illuminate the history of the black Berkshires, of African Americans in this place, including many of the quote unquote luminaries we've talked about today. That's Agrippa Hull, um, whose descendant is our board chair. It's also um, Freeman and Du Bois, and many others whose names are less well known, but, but need not be. Um, the Du Bois Forum, um, uh, is, is, is one piece of this project, which is aiming to bring together um, black scholars, writers, and artists to do their work individually, collectively. This was something Du Bois talked about beginning in the 19 teens and into the 20s. He was scouting for land through Warren Davis, um, uh, looking for land in Great Barrington or beyond uh, in the Berkshires to house more or less a retreat center like this. He held convenings a little bit further afield at Joel Spingarn's estate, uh, the Amenia conferences in 1916 and 1933. Um, he was hard at work on this idea. Um, he purchased back that, what he called the House of the Black Burghearts on Egremont Plain, his, his grandfather's and grandmother's home, um, and thought that one day he would do his writing there. That never came to pass, and he had to give the property up in the late 1950s, shortly before he died. Um, but one of our goals is to make that dream a reality, and we had our inaugural convening uh, last month on July 8th to 10th, a, a collection of 25 writers, scholars, and artists, intergenerational. Um, including Chad Williams. <laughs> yeah. Including Chad Williams and, and others that have spoken out here recently. Um, this is in, with the, the deep support of, of um, Du Bois' biographer, David Loving Lewis. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but happy to talk more about that. But if you want, please, please, please get involved, stay involved, if you're not on the list of already, join it. Yes. Um, take the brochure on your way out. There's a magazine, the Berkshire Magazine this month has an article about the center as well. It's still in the grocery store, so get that. <laughs> oh no, I'm up for tenure, so I'll, I'll hand this over to these two. I'm already tenured. <laughs> we won't tell Karen. <laughs> I, I can say, I'll just say one corner of the thing, which is um, it's been an absolute honor to be able to um, work with Carrie on the After American Trail project with the support of our university, Tufts University, yeah. um, and to do public history, public humanities work that comes out of the university, makes use of university resources, but is not about the university. <laughs> And so um, that's been just a, a, a joy over the last five years. And, and it's through that work that we came to, um, to work with Eugenie, who's right here, and Francis, and, and others, um, and, and scholars um, like Francis and Mary Nell Morgan and others here in the Berkshires um, to um, bring attention to African American history um, in, a, in, a, in a public and, and in a way that's rooted in communities. Um, so that, I think, is a, is a pleasant turn of events amidst the you know, impending demise of the humanities, if not the higher education. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I will say, I will, <laughs> I will say that, you know, I, I think that there are good people, there are individual scholars in academia who are doing the work. Um, even if the kind of academy is crumbling around them, they're managing to do, you know, pu public facing work and really doing the 
um, scholarly work that goes into producing very quality public public work. So there are up, us out there as well. The academy is hanging on. There kind of are like a, a small cohort of people that that you know uh, Kendra, of course, and Zary, but who are doing um, good public. Work. <laughs> okay. It, what? Yes, Barbara. Don't we get that story from uh, Catherine's uh, account? Um, so that's, uh, it seems that uh, Elizabeth Freeman loved to tell stories. Um, to, and Catherine, you know, remembered these stories and that's what uh, she recorded as her memory of Elizabeth Freeman telling these stories to her. And that was one of the stories that she told uh, about defending uh, the uh, Sedgwick China or Oh, so silver. silver, yeah, yeah. And, um, so I'm not sure when she began um, working as a paid midwife, but I do think it's while she was living with the Sedgwick's and she helped with the births there in the house. Um, I'm now, some of you are probably familiar with that documentary um, about, was it Cherry Cottage? Is that right? I mean, I think that there was also, there was a newspaper article about the fact that she was a midwife for, was it David Dudley Field? I'm, this is really, I, I, I'm stretching here, but I, I do, there, is, there are accounts of her working as a paid midwife for sort of prominent people in the town. Um, and Williams. Williams, right. And uh, so you can do what, I'm, I really, this is very fuzzy for me if you want to try to answer it. Uh, but so I, I don't know if there's any records on birth certificates, but there are people who say, you know, she was present at my birth, she participated in this birth. Um, and she was really known and respected for that, as well as as a healer, too. Um, so when people were ill, they would call her. Um, and this, and so, so I think that that's another important piece of the story that I, I wish we w could know more about. Well, once again, I just want to thank Dr. Francis Jones Sneed. Uh, <laughs> Sarah Edelstein, Dr. Kendra Fields, Dr. Carrie Greenwich. <laughs>